Good morning, everyone. I'm Jim Bankowski, uh, class of 91, and a member of your campaign committee. Uh, it was uh, over 30 years ago that I was here. I, uh, at that point, there was no such thing as Google. There was no such thing as YouTube. And you couldn't watch any, of, any session like this online. So it's kind of ironic that after all that time, I became a distinguished engineer at Google and got to have a big impact on the kind of video technology that empowers online video today. Great education that I received from Binghamton uh, enabled me to succeed and uh, really make a difference in this world. And that's the kind of thing that inspires and excites me about Binghamton University, the power it has to um, not just prepare students for their future, but to inspire them to do things that really matter in this world. So I'm really excited to be able to open today's session, um, uh, an exceptional education, and to uh, hear from some students who are doing some amazing undergraduate research uh, work. Um, to that end, I'd like to introduce Valerie Imbruce, who uh, is an instructor in the environmental studies program, but also the director for undergraduate, um, sorry, the, uh, <coughs> the director for uh, undergraduate research and external scholarships. Uh, she's helped set up under uh, university-wide undergraduate research programs, uh, and she helps students compete for uh, externally funded awards. Uh, on top of that, she has uh, been funded by the National Science Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, on top of that, like us, she's a Binghamton alum from the year 1999. And, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, she's a, uh, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, Ms. Allery. Appreciate it. Hello. It's so nice to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I bet there's a lot of feelings right, coming back to your alma mater. I know I felt that way coming back here in 2015 to start working here to help Binghamton reach its potential and for our students to reach their potential. So I'll set the stage a little bit for you this morning about what is an exceptional education, how we see that here at Binghamton, how we're reaching for that. When I think about an exceptional education, I think about an educational institution that can adapt to change. Um, certainly, we've seen that. We've been forced to do that in the past few years, responding to the pandemic, right? providing remote instruction, still trying to provide on-campus experiences, helping our students succeed. But we don't want to adapt in a reactionary fashion. right? We want to be proactive. So how do we plan for the future? How do we take steps now so that we can ensure that Binghamton remains vibrant? Well, when I think about that question, that question that underlies our work here, and that I invite you all to think about along with us, um, I think about the core values right, that drive us. I think that's where we need to start in thinking about strategizing the future of education. And the core values for me in education go back to some of the foundational philosophies from the 20th century about why we have education. Right? And that's because education is the foundation of democracy. Right? That's what John Dewey told us. That's what he reminded us at a time when, when our country and many countries around the world were becoming more mechanized. Right? Factories were becoming more mechanized. Right? To remind us that students, our citizens, are not just kind of cogs in this larger machine, but they need to be free thinkers right? to, to, to help us self-govern, to represent needs of people and, and create the societies that we want. And so educational institutions are foundational to our democracy um, and to our society where we, we want to attain freedom and equality for all. But education is also highly personal, right? It's about human development. It's about our personal growth. It's the personal growth of our students, about each unique student reaching their unique potential. And helping students along that trajectory right, is our job as educators. We want them to bring their best selves here. We need to bring our best selves here to help them along. And so that entanglement of the personal and the societal is fundamental to education. 
And it helps, it helps me, I think, and it helps us chart just how to shift our educational structures to adapt to the changing needs of our students coming in. I mean, education at K through 12 is mandatory. It's a legal contract we all must fulfill. Higher education is different. People choose to come. And those choices and the reasons for them are changing. The demographics of our student, of our college going population are changing. And that's what part of what we need to recognize. Many of our students here at Binghamton are first generation. First ones in their families going to college. An amazing opportunity. Um, many of our students are also multi-generation from Binghamton families, which I, I love seeing that when I do open houses for prospective students. I meet parents who are coming back here and, and pulling me aside and saying, I really want my son or daughter to come here. I'm trying to get them there. You know, it's like, and I feel like I'm in the, like, this covert mission along with the parent to help convince the student. Um, I went here. This place really helped me along. It helped provide the foundation for me to go on, develop myself as an environmental scientist, as a professor, and now as an educational administrator where I can shift some of the structures here to make sure we have a forward-looking, exceptional educational um, program offerings for our students. And so I'll tell you a little bit about those, and then our three students will really um, showcase right, what our programs have done for them. There are three main points, I would say, that we focus around um, in my office through the colleagues that I work with and across the university um, that make Binghamton exceptional, in my opinion. Um, one is focusing on hands-on, student-driven, student-centered, right, inquiry-driven work. And this is putting students in charge of their education, right? Students just don't come here, you know, vacant, ready to learn. They have experiences already. They have skills already. We're building upon those. And so in the very first year, we have programs that students can start doing research. Right? They can start learning the methodologies of a discipline or of multiple disciplines, the concepts that they need to ask questions and answer them and build argumentative um, essays, right? evidence-based decision making. Right? Research isn't just about scholarship. Um, it's about a process of taking in information, interpreting it, and coming out with with one's informed opinion, and that's a life skill. And we see, and that's what we, we work on in these first year research programs, that now we have our first year research immersion in the, in the natural sciences. We have the source project, research in the social sciences and the humanities, right? And we have hundreds of students going through these programs, and we hope, we plan to increase our enrollment capacity in these programs so that by the time students graduate, right now we have 36% of our seniors having some kind of undergraduate research experience. We want to grow that number. Second area, interdisciplinarity, right? University set up, we all know this, you have departments, you have majors, fine, we have specializations, expertise is important, but there's limits to that. People need to come together, collaborate, right? build upon each other's expertise, recognize the, the edges of their own, recognize the different ways of understanding the world, whether it's a scientific point of view or it's more an experiential or constructive um, perspective sort of point of view about how we understand the world. How do we bring these two together? Around that idea of interdisciplinarity, our provost has set up these transdisciplinary areas of excellence. We have faculty and staff from all domains in the university working on research problems and sustainable communities and smart energy and health sciences and data sciences, citizenship, rights and belonging, material and visual worlds, all these incredible areas. And I see it and I see this as a place right, where we can make connections to our curriculum. And that's really exciting. How do we bring students into this interdisciplinary enterprise? And so we have this spin-off project called Materials Matter that's teaching science alongside the humanity, saying that humanistic inquiry and scientific inquiry enhance one another, right? They're not opposing tracks. Um, we have a smart energy scholars program where students who have financial need are being supported, transfer here from community colleges to start here and to come together in seminars to connect with, with 
um, working professionals to think about our alternative and smart energy futures. Okay, some of the, some of the exciting programs we have. Um, and then thirdly, the third area I think is really fundamental to exceptional education that we're working around is seeing the university and our classrooms not as a refuge from the world, not as separate from the world, but as a doorway to right, the world. And that to me looks like connecting our class experiences, connecting our research with communities, audiences outside of the academy, right, taking problems that arise from communities and using that as a fulcrum to teach around, to do research around, and giving those experiences to our students through their assignments, through internships, through their research projects, to connect with organizations and people outside of the university. And so, with those three areas in mind, I'm going to introduce our students who will talk to them um, amazing students, and we have many at Binghamton, and I have the great privilege of working with really exceptional students who go on to win national awards from the National Science Foundation and Goldwater and Fulbright. This year we have four Fulbright semifinalists looking to go out and be cultural ambassadors of the United States. It's a really powerful way to put Binghamton out into the world as well. So, I'm sure you're anxious to hear from our students. First, you will hear from Samantha Sylvain. Samantha is a sophomore. Samantha was a student in our first year research immersion program. And so she will tell you a little bit about what that experience was like and where it's bringing her. I got to know Samantha because she applied to our Summer Scholars and Artists program, which is a summer program rerun where students are paid to do research full time under the mentorship of a faculty member over the summer. And students say, this is a really incredible experience because they can focus solely on one project. They're not juggling it between four other classes. They do it over the summer. It's the first time, many times, that they're doing something really independent, like an apprenticeship, you know, under the, under the guidance of their faculty mentor. And so this is how I got to know Samantha. She, last summer, worked on a project um, about biological controls for a pest, maybe some of you have heard about the hemlock woolly adelgid. It's an insect, a sap-sucking insect that's been devastating forests in the northeast of the United States. Hemlock is an old growth tree. It's incredibly important for riparian habitat as well as forest structure. So she's looking at biological controls for this pest. I can't wait to see what Sam will do in the rest of her years here. And I will introduce her now, Sam. Hello everyone, my name is Samantha Sylvain and I am an undergraduate biochemistry major here at Binghamton University. Since the halcyon days of my youth, I have always wanted to conduct scientific inquiry and leave an indelible impact upon the natural world through my understanding of the forces that drive biological processes. I would do my best to be observant of the life that unraveled all around me, at the playground, how light passed through the leaves and how small organisms work together to sustain their little lives. This was my initial and incomplete concept of what the life of a scientist was, but nonetheless, I was adamant that as I grew, I would be able to fill in the gaps uh, and ensure that my life would be abounding in discovery and innovation. Prior to attending Binghamton University, I fretted over whether I would be able to transmute a childhood dream into a reality and orchestrate my own destiny. Fortunately, I did not despair for long. Through the guidance provided by mentors in the Freshman Research Immersion Program and my participation in the Summer Scholars and Artists Program, I was able to make my reveries of adventures in STEM more tangible. I was able to partake in the environmental visualization stream of the FRI program, where I was enlightened of the significance of remote sensing, sensing technologies, including LIDAR for mind detection, um, for minds that imperil overlooked communities and school children, or for the analysis of changes to the photosynthetic activity of communities of trees as a consequence of climate change or as a result of the presence of an invasive pest or pathogen. I was eventually assigned to and able to collaborate with a team of students who I regard as luminary minds of our generation. 
we were able to devise a prospective solution to the uncontrolled spread of an invasive pest known infamously as hemlock wool woolly adel adelgid. That is imperiled hemlock trees, a gorgeous evergreen keystone species that plays pivotal roles in its environment, including nutrient cycling, flood prevention, and the provision of habitats for fish, birds, and small mammals. We initially proposed that combinations of specialist adelgid predators would be effective at eradicating these vampiric pests instead of the chemical controls that are currently being used throughout the United States and even here in Binghamton University's Nature Preserve, which have not been proven to be completely effective at eliminating these pests that can kill trees that should live to be 800 years um, within four years, often before they reach reproductive maturity. Moreover, some chemical controls for HWA, such as imidacloprid, are known to have negative effects upon key pollinators like bees. If you were to go to the nature preserve sometime between March and May, right, um, you would be able to see the white woolly masses of eggs um, belonging to the HWA across the underside of hemlock twigs. The devastation and the death that follows their presence is very visible and leaves a lasting impact upon those who um, are have the misfortune of seeing it. It is clear that chemical controls are not uh, sufficient on their own. Through further research, I realized that a variety of insect killing fungus in combination with the specialist allergic predatory beetles would be a more effective and novel biological control than more than a simple combination of beetles, which has already been attempted one way or another. The only issue, of course, was we did not know whether these biological control organisms would be compatible or whether the fungus would be able to kill off the beetles that could be introduced to North, America, North American forests on a wider scale to resolve the hemlock tree crisis. The Summer Scholars and Artists program provided this opportunity for me to help my team and gain vital information for our ambitious endeavor of preserving biodiversity and conducting a pilot study that will allow us to examine the feasibility of designing such a study that address their compatibility. My SSAP experience allowed me to cultivate skills that were translatable and applicable to my ambitions of conducting research in, in a wet lab as a biochemist. This included strict adherence of lab safety protocols, how to prepare conidial suspensions, adjust their concentrations, and troubleshoot when necessary, such as perfecting the construction and escape safety measures for the beetle containment units I created. I was able to gain a comprehensive understanding of the life of a research scientist, its intrigue, and its difficulties. Today, I continue to excel as a scholar in biochemistry and develop new interests in research, such as in novel drug discovery and an understanding of the dominant folding pathways of proteins that inform related applied research. I also continue to aspire to make the immaterial essence of my dreams into something more palpable or tangible or material, whether it be through science or writing. Through courses such as creative writing and techno-romanticism here at Binghamton University, I have gained the strength to overcome my anxieties, my OCD, and articulate the insights and visions of the universe which combines both the occult and science fiction theories that have satiated my desires for escape through literature. In fact, for my creative writing course, I'm currently writing a fiction which integrates my newfound love for invertebrate pathology developed during my SSAP experience, genetics, and the occult and is founded upon my experiences here at Binghamton University, the inspirational people I have met, and the skills I have attained. I hope to commence the publishing process soon after the semester ends. Biochemistry is an inherently interdisciplinary field of study, which has inspired and is inspired by my creative pursuits outside of STEM. Ultimately, the impetus for my progress is my inquisitive nature and zeal for acquiring new knowledge, unraveling the underlying mechanisms of biological processes through experimentation, and exploring the realms of the unconscious through literature. I also, of course, have a fondness for the beauty and intellect I perceive in others, and their resilience through adversities that bring out their talents and passion for life. This includes the other August student panelists who will be introdu introducing themselves here tonight, um, today. Lastly, I would like to thank Professor Ortiz and Dr. M. Bruce for this opportunity to share how Binghamton University has contributed to my growth as a young scientist. Thank you. So in our student success, we all succeed, right? <laughs> um, next, we have Maya Tierney, who is a senior. She'll be graduating this May. 
going off to do some exciting things she'll tell you about. Maya is in political science um, with a minor in immigration and Spanish and a double major in human development in our, our College of Community and Public Affairs. And I got to know Maya. She came into to my office interested in applying for an international scholarship called the Mitchell Scholarship for Leadership and Service to Study in Ireland. Just a little bit ambitious, right? Um, so I got to know Maya through that way and how she has worked in global and local communities. She's committed to public service, thinking about pre-law, really epitomizing that doorway concept, right, from the classroom and the university to the world. So please, I introduce Maya. Hello, good morning everyone. My name is Maya Tierney and I am a pre-law student in my senior year majoring in political science and human development with minors in Spanish and immigration studies. My time at Binghamton University has fostered my passion for both public service and global affairs. Before I even began studying here, during my senior year of high school, I received an email from Professor Al Voss, and he was reaching out to admitted human development majors because the curriculum linked closely with the values and goals of his public service learning community. The public service learning community is a floor in Hughes Hall of Hinman College, and the students living on this floor partake in civic engagement and service learning courses, as well as participating in service projects. Little did I know that taking him up on his invitation would frame my entire college experience in the most positive way. The floor was made up of civically minded individuals um, with diverse talents and interests. The floor was home to nursing, math, political science, business, and human development majors who are united by our passion for service. Each semester, we volunteered consistently at sites such as a parolee reentry program, local elementary schools, and a homeless shelter. Through these experiences, I have been able to learn about the different areas of public service and learn from teachers and case managers who have given so much of themselves to serve their communities. The endless academic and experiential opportunities have filled my time with Binghamton with a deep sense of purpose. The combination of human development and political science has allowed me to study both the obstacles that people face in their lifetimes, as well as the institutions that govern our societies. My professors have all demonstrated a massive commitment to not just ensure we understand the content that we're learning in the classroom, but also how to put it into practice. An example is Professor Wendy Martinick in her Supreme Court Political Science Seminar, where we conducted legal research and we were reading the justices' opinions of the court. And then afterwards, she crafted this really complex legal hypothetical scenario based on a search and seizure case. And I was excited to be assigned to write a brief in the voice of Justice Sonia Sotomayor and to question my classmates who were presenting as attorneys in a mock oral argument. Experiences like these, which would not be possible without the creativity and dedication of our faculty, have made me competitive as I apply and interview for jobs and internships. During the summer of my senior year, I had the incredible opportunity to intern with the New York County District Attorney's Office in the Office of the Special Narcotics Prosecutor. And this office has, felony, has jurisdiction over felony narcotics cases in the five boroughs. I also interned in Binghamton last spring at the, as an immigrant and legal services intern at the American Civic Association. And then this past summer, I had the incredible opportunity to participate in the Harper Law Council's summer internship program. And this program provides 10 students with funded legal internships and would not be possible without the work of Leah Joggerst and Alex Jablonski, as well as the alumni support. I was fortunate enough through this experience to be placed with the New York City Department of Education in the Administrative Trials Unit. And this unit conducts disciplinary hearings for teachers accused of misconduct, including corporal punishment and sexual abuse. I was one of nine summer law clerks and I was the only undergraduate student in this placement. Starting my first day, I acted as a second seat for a Department of Education attorney in both hearings and witness prep, produced memorandums, a legal brief, and obtained criminal case records to be used as evidence in these hearings. My assignments were used to advocate for the voices of student victims of teacher misconduct as well as help attorneys construct their arguments. 
My final brief is about whether in a 320A administrative proceeding, the department and the arbitrator could rely on hearsay as the sole basis for a finding of misconduct. The cases I researched pointed to yes, and even in times where contradictory, contradictory evidence was presented. Turning in this assignment was a satisfying and tangible takeaway, applying everything I've learned throughout the summer. Through these placements, I've developed a love of trial work and collaborating with both witnesses and attorneys to seek fair outcomes. I was also very impressed by the attorneys who have devoted their careers to fighting for the safety of students in my city. While I am not exactly sure what I want to pursue in this field, this opportunity made me realize I want to do something at the local and global level to better the lives of people in my communities. I am thrilled to be here today because my experiences here at Binghamton have been deeply impacted by your kindness and generosity. When the pandemic struck, I was lucky enough that my summer internship was still being held remotely, but unfortunately, the stipend payment was cut. If it were not for the Student Affairs Internship Fund, I would not have been able to complete my internship with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Additionally, my internship with the Department of Education was made possible through the generosity of the Harper Law Council. And yesterday, I received really exciting news that I received an internship placement this summer through the university's Human Rights Institute to work in England at a refugee family reunification legal clinic housed in Sheffield Halem University. And I'm grateful to Dr. Moore for her work. Thank you. <laughs> I am grateful to Dr. Moore for her work to secure a multitude of opportunities for students, as well as the generosity of the Binghamton Fund for making this possible. And I'd be remiss if I also do not mention the endless support that I have received from the External uh, Scholarships Office and the Undergraduate Research Center, as well as the Fleischmann Center for Career and Professional Development. Fleischmann has helped me with countless of mock interviews and resume and cover letter checks uh, that made me feel proud of the application materials that I can produce. This year, I have worked extensively with Dr. Jager, receiving hours of individualized attention on a myriad of fellowship and graduate school applications. Her support has made me believe in myself and also get some joy throughout this very extensive process. I am grateful to the university community for making my time here so special and full. When I arrived here for school, I knew alumni would impact my experience, but I never imagined that this impact would be so tangible and direct. And my main takeaway of my time here at Binghamton, and this is a lesson I learned both from my peers as well as the alumni, is ways that I can be generous with my time and presence. I've had countless of conversations with alumni in my field, and many have been kind enough to spend an hour with me discussing how they got to where they are and looking over my application materials. Similarly, I have been in awe of my peers for their dedication to bettering their fields and this community. I'm inspired by the ways my friends in the Decker School of Nursing speak about the patients they work with. My friend, through her clinical rotations, recently worked with a hospice patient and discovered that hospice care was her calling. I'm also currently enrolled in a requisite practicum in human development course. Um, and each week, we share the work we are doing in the community and beyond. So it's impossible not to leave this class with a sense of optimism just from hearing everyone's uh, great involvement. Every day I witness the tenacity, the high caliber of our student body, and the ways in which our students help each other. Therefore, I truly believe that investing in Binghamton is one of the best investments you can make because students, like our alumni, are so committed to giving back. I feel blessed for these amazing four years, and I am looking forward to graduating and joining your ranks and hope to pay your generosity forward in the, for the next generation of Binghamton students. Thank you. I can feel the pride in the room. <laughs> so finally, you will hear from Liam McGurk, also leaving us this May, graduating senior, going on to medical school. But his path to medical school was not tried and true. He thought it might be, he will tell you the story, but Liam wound up double majoring. So much like Samantha is using her interest in science to also explore creative writing and science fiction, Liam is coming to medicine from combining his interest in the classics, classical civilization, ancient Rome and Greece, and science. And <clears throat> Liam came to my attention through participating in the Materials Matter Initiative 
that I told you about. It's a gen ed course that carries lab science and aesthetics general education credits. Um, Liam took his experience in that course and he put forward a proposal to the Undergraduate Research Center for our Undergraduate Research Award. We give up to $1,000 to students um, individually each semester to support their research projects. And Liam put forward a proposal to look at the active components within an ancient recipe for a healing ointment that came from a Roman elder. And great idea, we wanted to support it, but needed a little bit of tweaking here and there. We gave him some comments back and Liam took them and he ran with it. He wasn't discouraged, he didn't scrap the idea as something far-fetched, he made it better. And he put that proposal back to us and we said, go, go on, here's your money, go do it. Find out something great. I present to you, Liam. Good morning. I hope you're all doing well. So yeah, I have a diverse range of interests. Thank you so much for the introduction but it didn't always start out that way. So here at Bing, I became interested in STEM, humanities, teaching, research in academia, but outside of that, like running, tennis, physical activity, even art, creation and appreciation. But I came here freshman year with a laser focus on becoming a physician. And laser focus is even an understatement. I used to tell people, I came to college to get into medical school. I'm here to go on to become a doctor. I thought of this chapter in my life as thin and filled with unimportant words, but I quickly realized that that was not the case and that the approach I was taking was significantly flawed. Previously in high school, I took Latin for three years and I took it because I wanted to unravel the cryptic language that labels the parts of our body. I wanted to understand anatomy better. I thought that learning the root words would help me a lot. And I did for three years. But Latin was getting more difficult and I was enjoying it less and less. But the cultural experience in the Latin class, learning about the Greco-Roman antiquity and the ancient Mediterranean still interested me. So looking to fulfill a general education requirement for the aesthetic perspective, freshman year, I registered to a Roman art history course. And the class kind of changed my life. I met one of my most important mentors in the class, and I also met some of my best friends. And they encouraged me to continue taking those classes, just simply for the fun of it. I started out in classics because I just wanted to do something fun and interesting with my time here. I had no intention of it actually having a substantial impact on my life. But actually, there's a lot of parallels between STEM and humanities, and I learned that this simple kind of adventure through something that I enjoy would actually make me a lot better and at the end in medicine. So how does the humanities interface with medicine? Medicine seems all scientific, but there is actually an art to medicine. So I've worked in pediatrics endocrinology, so that means diabetes, right? A lot of kids have diabetes. So when attendings tell trainees that it's impossible to treat diabetes, they look very confused. They've learned about diabetes in medical school. We know how to treat the disease. We have treatments available. And now they're actually very good. Recently published was an article about external pancreas, kind of like automating the system. So these patients have really good outcomes and they know about that and the trainees are always confused. So the attendings explain that to treat diabetes, you can't just treat the disease. You have to treat the whole patient. You have to treat the child. What motivates the child? What technology are they willing to work with and what won't they work with? What's gonna work for them to create a better treatment plan? What works for them for them to have the best outcome? It's very much more individualized. And that's the art of medicine, connecting with your patient, understanding their unique and individual needs and providing for those needs to give your patient the best quality of care. In addition, evidence-based medicine is the new trend of our field, maybe for the last 10 or 20, 30, 40 years really, very focused on providing research and understanding the science behind medicine, which is great. That's how our patients get better treatment. But we have to find space for the art of medicine within evidence-based practice. We can't just think about the research. We have to think about our patients using the humanistic perspective. And that's why lots of medical schools have actually started classes called the Art and Science of Medicine. I, the first thing that comes to mind for me is Mount Sinai and their new initiative on the Art and Science of Medicine, or schools like the University of Rochester that really pride themselves on science and humanities in treating patients because they understand the value that it brings to provide better care. 
It also creates a better connection between the doctor and the patient, which is great for our patients. They get better individualized care, but it's also great for physicians. In a landscape of increasing burnout and job dissatisfaction in our profession, we can increase a sense of commitment, increase a sense of purpose in our you know, physician colleagues, and when they treat patients that they feel connected to, we can hope to decrease that burnout that many, many of our colleagues experience, unfortunately. So there's some other parallels I want to address that are kind of outside of that first cluster, but evaluating streams of evidence. These are skill-based parallels. So in classics, I learned how to evaluate several different streams of evidence to understand the ancient world. My mentor describes classics, and especially classical archaeology, as putting together a puzzle, but half of the pieces are missing, or more, and the lid on the box is also gone. So there's no image to kind of guide you through putting the pieces together. But, so learning how to combine literary evidence, but also epigraphical evidence, like textual inscriptions, with the material record and archaeological remains, that's how we create a reconstruction of the ancient past. The same way that physicians learn to create a reconstruction of their patient's experience and their disease through imaging studies, diagnostic tests, and a physical exam. In addition, I think both of these fields struggle from a misconception. When you think of archaeology, you probably think about stuff, the materials, the things. You think of like a museum and all the cool stuff that archaeologists find on their digs. But archaeology is actually about people. It's about learning through the stuff about people. But it's ultimately about people. In the same way, medicine falls victim to a similar misconception. Most people think that medicine is about science, but it's not. Medicine is about people, and using the science applied to people to treat disease and to better people's lives. So learning about classics helped me to kind of experience more of that misconception and understand it better. So I learned how to bring them together because they've always been siloed. I know Dr. Imbrus spoke a little bit about siloing, right? They're separate groups. Interdisciplinary work breaks through those groups. And bringing them together has been the most incredible experience because I was able to fuse both of my very different passions. So Materials Matter, which you heard about a little bit before, is a course that focuses on the art and science of materials. And I was a TA last semester. So we taught a lab on the Nefertiti bust. It was a bust found in Egypt that now is in Germany. And there's many questions about its authenticity. Was it created by the hands of an ancient sculptor, or is it a modern dupe? We can understand this, we can address the question using chemical analysis of the pigments on the bust. Are they ancient materials or were they invented in the 18th or 19th century? Obviously, Egyptians didn't have 18th or 19th century access to pigments. So we can then infer if the sculpture is a fake or not. And we can use this information to address claims about cultural property and repatriation. Does Egypt want the bust back if it's not real? Does Germany want the bust at all if it's fake? So learning how to combine classics and the humanities side with the STEM side, bringing them together to address the same question is valuable because you, it enriches each other. In addition, my independent study project is about assessing the efficacy of an ancient remedy, trying to understand what the ancient physician noticed when they prescribed a remedy. Why would they recommend it? Does it have antimicrobial properties? Does it promote wound closure on the skin? I'm studying a skin remedy. It's a mixture of honey and a plant, narcissus, daffodil bulbs. So when these are mixed together, many ancient writers say that it promotes uh, wound healing. But how does it promote wound healing? In the laboratory, I'm actually working to discover how. Does it work to kill microbes on the skin? Does it kill microbes or just stop them from spreading? Does it promote skin cells to migrate together and form junctions? Does it promote wound closure? So using the scientific perspective, I'm actually able to understand the experience of the ancient physician a lot better. I'm excited to take all these experiences I've learned here and the enrichment that I found in humanities and interdisciplinary work to medical school in the fall. Thank you all so much. So now we'll have the pleasure of hearing from you we could spend the next 10 minutes or so together um, having a discussion, having a question and answer session. So there will be mics positioned on either side of the room. You could see them, they're on the stand. So feel free to make your way over if you'd like to ask a question or maybe send a message down your row. <laughs> um, we also have the virtual audience here that's giving us messages through our shared doc on the tablet. 
And so I'm going to kick off with one of these questions here as you all in the live audience are thinking of something. We have a question. What hopes do you have for the development of your field of study, maybe your majors or your minors here, or the profession you could see yourself going into over the next 10 years? This is a tough one. <laughs> I think I'd like to give, um, yeah. I'll mm -hmm. just answer succinctly. I think I'd like to see more dis, um, racial di diversity, gender diversity. Um, I want to see people that um, I love like at the forefront of science and making advances and um, innovations that um, allow for the transcendence of society and um, our further development. Um, yeah. Wonderful, I'm so glad you brought up that diversity in science is an incredibly important issue. just access and I think that everyone should have access to legal services to uh, citizenship and all these um, different um, legal uh, recognitions that really make a massive difference in people's lives and experiences. I want to see people continue breaking the mold. I think that people here at Binghamton break the mold. We kind of, a lot of my, the faculty I've worked with, they go outside of the box and I want that to continue because I think that's how we really make progress in scholarship, but also progress like, in general terms. Wonderful. So we have another question here from our virtual audience. Let's see. Which one? OK. This is a personal question for you to think about. What is the most surprising thing you have learned about yourself here at Binghamton? I learned how flexible I could be. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I thought that I was really rigid when I came here. And I, I was, I was really rigid. So, <laughs> but you know, like live and learn, grow, experience. Um, you know, and I'm really grateful that this place helped me kind of move out of that rigidity to experience life as a squiggly line instead of a straight one. It is much more interesting, fun, exciting. You learn a lot more. It takes you a lot more different places. And I'm glad that I'm a lot less rigid. Uh, I think during my time at Binghamton, I've just gained a lot of confidence and I've definitely become tougher. Like something I wasn't expecting on doing is joining the rugby team and I was, <laughs> I was recruited um, in Hughes Hall and to go to a practice one day and it was just really transformative. I love it so much and I actually was captain last season and I've just developed this love for a new sport that's brought me this really special community here. So um, yeah, that was probably the most surprising thing that <laughs> has happened to me at Binghamton. Um, I think I would have to say being um, a part of the environmental visualization stream um, with um, drones and remote sensing technologies. Um, I initially envisioned myself or whatever role that I would play in the FRI program as like being like maybe more pertinent to um, biochemistry, biophysics, what my career would be, but I found um, that I was able to be resilient and endure whatever challenges came. Um, which were surprising in and of themselves, as I had no prior exposure to, um, to actually coding with Python or um, using QGIS as an application to, anal um, to analyze um, uh, data captured with such technology. And uh, I, I just, I found, I confirmed that I would be able to acquire new knowledge um, regardless of whatever realm of science it um, encompassed, yeah. Wow. So I just have to say, when we were prepping for this panel, um, I asked each of our panelists to send some pictures. We were thinking about what pictures we might use. And Maya sent a picture of her playing rugby like with people all around her, <laughs> all muddy. And I really wanted to use that one, but no, I don't think it made the cut. <laughs> we have a question over here, I think, on, on my right. And then we'll move to the question on my left. So please, sir. So. Um... First, an observation. I, I don't know if Liam knew this, but the Nefertiri bust was actually recovered as a piece of looted art after World War II by, a Bingham, by someone who went on to become a professor of art history here at Binghamton named Ken Lindsay. Uh -huh. And maybe some people in this room knew Ken Lindsay. Uh -huh. And 
And there's a picture in the National Archives, you can find it online, of Ken Lindsay sitting at his desk writing reports with the Nefertiri bust on his desk. He used to keep it on his desk because he loved it so much. Wow. So I'm sure that Ken Lindsay somewhere in heaven would actually be excited at the idea that you were doing this research. That's a, um, no, I didn't know that. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah it was, it's really something. It's an interesting connection between you and Binghamton's history. It's really wonderful. Um, but my question is, you each have had such wonderful experiences here. I'm wondering whether in your journey, did your professors, as you started getting into your research, begin to talk to you about this is what it would be like if you pursued a career in? Did they begin to, to try to help you see uh, how, what it would be like on a day-to-day -day basis to pursue these kind of interests in a career? Um, I think I could answer that one. Because um, um, prior to coming, I had a lot of misconceptions of what science was like, um, a lot of it like based off of just my childhood misconceptions of what a scientist was. I thought just speakers and <laughs> um, weird chemicals and tubes. And so, um, and I thought that I would be a biochemist rather than like simply study it um, and actually branch out. I, I learned to appreciate the interdisciplinary nature of my studies, that I'm not studying to become something, I'm studying to learn and to acquire skills that are gen um, generally applicable, applicable or translatable. Uh, through my legal professors and my you know, human rights research, I've definitely been told by some people to avoid the field, avoid going to law school. I think that's something a lot of lawyers uh, say and have said to me. Um, but I think like learning from all of them, their passion has made me more committed to you know wanting to do this. But I think I'm really going into it with this you know important re reality um, check that they've given me, and I think just hearing from their experiences has uh, definitely been really valuable. And yeah, to add to that, I think the biology department does a really great job because well, in one of our core major courses, mechanisms of evolution, which I TA'd last spring, we have career day, essentially. So one of the discussion classes is allotted for career improvement, career development. So you meet with our professor. There's maybe like 25 students in the discussion class. You meet with the professor kind of like a, in a small group setting to discuss career prospects, what it's like to be a scientist, what can you do with a biology degree? Because you can do more than just research and medicine with a biology degree. And there's a, you know, a whole expansive array of things you can do and we talk about that and as the TA I kind of like sat in and watched and listened after having gone through it myself and I thought it was really exciting a lot of students really got positive experience out of that so, so we'll move to our another another question from this gentleman here hi my name is Barry Chaffin I'm a proud uh, Harper alumni from 1986 I would not have made it to the stage as a distinguished student that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> However, I, I'm doing some work now with CCPA, and this was really directed mostly to Maya. I wonder what you think we could do more to promote, you know, college of community and public affairs. What a really powerful message, and you know, training future leaders who are going to make a difference in the world. And do you think students know enough about CCPA and how you might go to Harper and do CCPA? I thought that was a great thing. So, how do you think we could best promote CCPA to the student body? Yeah, no, I definitely think that's a huge challenge. I agree that um, you know it's not you know as known as I think it should be. I think the main reason, especially for undergraduates, is CCPA has two undergraduate majors, which are social work and human development. Um, I kind of fell into it. I was accepted to CCPA, and I was not really sure how that happened. I thought I kind of like applied to Harper, but I started CCPA, <laughs> and I really loved it. And um, yeah, I agree. I think it's really important for students to be involved in CCPA. I think that there's a lot of Harper students who would also benefit from you know taking on a double major in CCPA. In terms of like your question with how to promote it, I'm not exactly sure the best way. I think hopefully word of mouth. I think a lot of students in human development are, like me are really passionate about it and excited about it. So I hope that it grows in the next few years um, because I think that there is a lot of positive impact that we have on our communities and we can bring back to us, uh, back home with us, you know, after um, our time and our education here. So. What do you think about like having lunch with a bunch of these really distinguished alumni and encouraging them to donate to CCPA? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <Sounds> good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and I think you will be able to ask the last question, so you will kick off and end our panel. All right. 
very exciting. I'm kind of curious if there are things that you saw that maybe Binghamton could even be better at with uh, additional funding or anything along those lines outside of the CCPA one, which we just heard about. <laughs> I know it's a hard question, sorry. <laughs> well, I, I'm the biology major, so I will say I would love for Science 3 to be renovated so much. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think that the campus has put a lot of money into renovations recently. This is a world-class university. It should look like one. So that means renovating this institution and you know, plenty of spaces on campus. We were just talking actually backstage about all the differences since freshman year. You know, this place has changed a lot, but still room for improvement, still room for construction. It shouldn't happen all at once, because that would probably be <laughs> kind of overwhelming. But, you know, if, you know, stages of construction, refinishing science three, you know, that would be incredible. That's my personal plug for my major, but. Um, for me, I believe we have so many amazing resources on this campus, like from the Career Center, to undergraduate research, and there's so many people on this campus who are willing to help. I think something that would be better is just having more like, act, like individual access and um, you know I was fortunate enough to be in a community where we like from the start we're really encouraged to seek out resources to attend job and internship fairs um, but I think being able to kind of reach out to students who may have not had the same exact experience where they were you know made aware of all the resources that this campus has to offer um, and being able to yeah I think with funding finding some ways to reach out to students in the individual level. I think, um, let's see, I, I guess it couldn't hurt for the um, SSAP to have additional funding. <laughs> I, I remember thinking um, it would be nice to have a few extra yeah. thousand for this project. <laughs> um, but, um, and perhaps maybe more funding for um, the FRI or like research for um, students who are um, just beginning their careers as young scientists. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I, I think you have a great day ahead of you. We will all be around through lunch, so we're happy to have more conversations with you. And please enjoy your time. And thank you so much for, for being a part of Binghamton.